Okay, we move uh, to uh, quite different topics, uh, and uh, uh, Rachel Rosen will uh, speak about modified gravity, the theory part. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing this, this terrific school so far. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to be discussing uh, various theoretical aspects of modified gravity. Uh, I'm going to focus on just giving some, some general background, um, what's the motivation, outstanding issues, uh, and then talk about recent developments. And in particular, I'm going to focus on recent developments uh, in massive gravity and in its closely related cousins, so Galileans, bigravity, and multigravity. Um, I wanted to refer you to these two excellent reviews uh, by Kurt Hinterbigler and Claudia Durham uh, that talk about a lot of the, the outstanding issues and, and recent developments in the field. All right, so why modify gravity? Why should we be talking about modified gravity? So most frequently, people talk about modified gravity in the context of trying to find a solution uh, to the cosmological constant problem. And so here I mean both the old and new problems. So why is the universe accelerating, and why is the acceleration so small? So our understanding uh, of cosmic acceleration uh, comes basically from gravitational, from indirect uh, observations of gravitational effects. And so it makes sense that we would ask, uh, maybe the solution to these problems lies in modifying gravity at very large distances. So that's, that's sort of the, the frequent motivation is, can modified gravity tell us anything about cosmic acceleration? Uh, but something sort of interesting happens when you, when you try to modify gravity, um, which is that it turns out that even from a, a theoretical standpoint, it turns out to be remarkably uh, difficult to write down consistent modifications of general relativity. Um, so I think, in fact, what's happened is that before we can even really discuss this question in great detail, we have to sort of address a, a much more basic, if no less compelling question, which is, are there consistent and well-motivated modifications of general relativity? And the usefulness in answering this question, um, beyond answering uh, uh, anything in particular about cosmic acceleration, is twofold. I mean, first of all, it, it turns out that these lead us to, to very, very fundamental questions uh, in field theory. So we're really asking about what are the, the fundamental constituents um, and forces that can go into a, a gravitational theory. And the second more practical reason why, why this is even an interesting question uh, is just simply that if we're testing general relativity already uh, via precision cosmology on these very large distances, we really should know what the alternative theories are. So what are the other possibilities besides GR that we could be observing? Okay, so I'm going to focus, uh, I'm going to be interested in long distance modifications of general relativity. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be focusing on massive gravity and its close cousins, Galileans, by gravity. Um, many other theories of modified gravity exist in the literature. Uh, my main reason for, for restricting to these is that they're conceptually, they're very simple uh, theories of modified gravity. Uh, and yet, even though they're simple, uh, they exhibit many of the usual theoretical obstacles that one encounters when trying to modify gravity, and also much of the rich phenomenology uh, that you can get from these theories. Uh, so here, I'm going to take uh, what's often referred to as sort of a particle physics approach to modifying gravity, uh, which is I'm really going to use the tools of a, a Lorentz invariant uh, field theory. Um, and, and in fact, the fact that we can even do this uh, for general relativity is, is somewhat non-trivial. Um, so it's, it's sort of fun to see that Right, it was in 1915, right? That Einstein formulated general relativity and formulated it um, in terms of, by identifying um, the gravitational field with a metric tensor of Riemannian geometry. It wasn't until 1939 that Fierz and Pauli first tried to formulate this theory in terms of a Lorentz invariant field theory. So that's a very long separation uh, in time. And what's somewhat remarkable, so, so Fierz and Pauli went about it uh, trying to write down just the theory of a free, massless spin-2 particle. They then looked at general relativity. They took the, the linearized limit, so they looked at the theory at lowest order in the fields. They showed that this, in fact, this coincided with the theory uh, of a Lorentz invariant 
massless spin two particle. And still there was some skepticism that these two theories had anything to do with each other. So we take it for granted nowadays um, that GR, of course, is, you know, and we'll talk about this, the unique uh, interacting theory of a Lorentz invariant spin two field uh, at, lo at low energies. Um, but, but this fact was, was originally, I want to emphasize, somewhat, somewhat non-trivial. All right, so uh, today, uh, so I should mention, uh, so I'm, I said I'm going to use the tools of Lorentz invariant th field theory. Uh, there's also a whole host of modified gravity theories uh, that are Lorentz violating. Um, and in fact, it's, it's easy to, to sort of evade, I shouldn't say easy, it's more easy to evade some of the usual obstacles uh, if you're willing to give up Lorentz invariants. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on Lorentz invariant modifications of general relativity. All right. So the idea is the following. So I'm going to take this, this particle physics approach, uh, which means that I'm going to pretend that we're, we're field theorists who've just discovered the force of gravity. So we've just discovered that, that two masses can attract each other. And we want to write down uh, a theory that can describe this new force that we've discovered. So how would we go about doing this? So we should start with the simplest possible theory. And that would be this theory of a scalar field, right? So can we write down a theory of a spin zero particle that can accurately describe the force of gravity? Well, we want to describe a long range force. So that compels us to look at a massless scalar field. So we could write down a theory of some massless scalar field phi, like so. All right, and because we want to, couple, because we want to describe uh, a force of gravity, the scalar field should somehow be coupled to the stress energy tensor of matter. Uh, but because phi carries no indices, it can only couple to the trace of the stress tensor. So I have to add some coupling like phi t uh, to my Lagrangian. And let me also introduce a coupling constant, g, like so. All right, so is this a viable theory of gravity? Well, what I can do is I can calculate the potential between two static objects mediated by the scalar field here. And when I do that, what I find is the following. So I find the potential V of R, which goes like minus G squared over 4 pi M1, M2 divided by R. So in fact, I do recover the correct Newtonian potential in this theory. All right, I said I was interested in a long distance modification, um, but I could also think of having a, a sorry, a long distance theory of gravity, so a, a theory of gravity that mediates a long range force. Um, but I can also add a small mass to this theory as well and see how that changes the potential that I want to describe. So going from a theory of a massless spin zero particle uh, to a massive spin zero particle, the effect that this is going to have on the potential is I'm going to find a Yukawa suppression at large distances, like so. So if this mass is small enough, uh, it's still possible that this theory of gravity um, could, could, could uh, be consistent with our, with our observations. OK, but the problem with this theory is that I've only coupled phi to the trace of the stress tensor here. And we know that relativistic matter uh, has a traceless stress tensor. So in particular, uh, for electromagnetism, trace of t is equal to 0. And what this means is that the scalar field doesn't interact then with relativistic matter. So what this is going to tell us is that this theory, you're going to see no bending of light in a gravitational field. So it's only non-relativistic matter um, for which I see this interaction. All right, so just based on this, we can rule out the possibility that the theory of gravity that we see today is mediated by a, singular, a single scalar field, like so. Yes? Yeah, so if you want to stick to a linear theory where you just have, say, phi interacting with t, you would have to couple, say, like a d mu d nu, t mu nu. And then because the stress tensor is conserved, this would give me zero by integration by parts. So. Oh. 
Yeah, so that, that would be higher order. Um, so it's, it's possible that you can write down these terms. Uh, this would be the leading order effect here uh, in, a, in a linear theory. Yeah, this, this is an inconsistent. Yeah. This is inconsistent. Uh, what, uh, I think you're still not going to get the correct bending of light. I mean, I think you would really have to tune it in order to, to yeah. Because, it, because that's going to be a much, uh, much suppressed compared to this coupling, which you would see for matter. And what you really want is the ratio of the two to be of order unity. Yeah. OK. So spin zero gravity fails uh, on observational grounds. Um, if we're taking this, this particle physics approach to gravity, we're saying, OK, uh, we should be, we classify particles according to their spin, so spin zero, half one, et cetera. We want to use uh, bosons to mediate long range forces. The next particle we should try is we should try and write down a spin one theory of gravity. OK, but spin one, so this means writing down some Lagrangian. Uh, that depends on some field a mu, and say it's derivatives, d mu, a nu, like so. Uh, but for spin one gravity, we can really use our intuition uh, from electromagnetism. We know automatically this theory would tell us that positive masses would repel each other. And because of this, we can right away rule out uh, a spin one theory of gravity. All right, skipping spin two for the moment. What about higher spins? So can I get, have a theory of gravity uh, made up of spin three or greater? Well, we know that we have very powerful no-go theorems, uh, largely due to Weinberg, that forbid interacting theories of high spin particles. So in fact, we see that if we want to describe gravity, we're really forced to look at spin two fields. And within spin two, we have these two possibilities. We can consider either a massless spin two or a massive spin two. All right, so since we're trying to mediate a long range force, let's start with the simplest case and let's consider just the theory of a free massless spin two particle. All right, so this was the action that was written down in 1939 by Fierce and Pauli. And for a massless particle, it takes the following form. So we have S is equal to the following. Uh, and we can couple to matter in the following way, introduce a one over MP, H mu nu, T mu nu, like so. So here, H mu nu, you can think of the metric fluctuation. So if I take G mu nu, and I expand around some flat background, so G mu nu equals eta mu nu, uh, and here I've canonically normalized so that this is eta mu nu plus H mu nu over MP. This is sim simply the Einstein-Hilbert action at lowest order in H, like so. All right, now H mu nu is a ring two symmetric tensor, which means that it carries 10 components with it. On the other hand, we know that a massive spin two field should only propagate two physical degrees of freedom, right? Two polarization, so plus two helicity and minus two helicity as well. All right, so what gets rid of these extra components? Well, the linearized theory uh, of a massless spin two particle enjoys a linearized diffeomorphism invariant. So this action is invariant under delta H mu nu equal to partial derivative d mu psi nu plus d nu psi mu, like so. And it's precisely this gauge invariance that's responsible for removing the extra components of H mu nu uh, and giving you the two propagating degrees of freedom uh, of the massless graviton. 
So it would be a diff invariance. We get two degrees of freedom. All right, we can ask the same thing that we asked over here. And we can ask, what's the phenomenology then um, of this theory of basically a free massless spin two field coupled to T mu nu in this way? So in order to do this, let's introduce a point source. So let's couple our theory to some t mu nu that's equal to m delta 0 mu delta 0 nu delta cubed x, like so. Uh, and I'm going to work in the Lorentz gauge, also known as the de Donder or harmonic gauge. Uh, which means that I'm going to set uh, d mu h mu nu minus 1 half d nu h equal to 0. All right, so in this gauge, I can solve for the components of h mu nu. And what I find is the following. So in spherical coordinates, I get h0, 0, zero is equal to minus m over 8 pi m plank r. And I get h i j is equal to m over 8 pi m p r. So h0, 0, zero we can identify with the Newtonian potential uh, after dividing by the appropriate factors of 2, minus 2. Uh, so we get, sorry, uh, in this language it's just 2. Uh, so we find the Newtonian potential phi of r is just going to be equal to minus g m divided by r. So here g is just the usual Newton constant, and I'm using units such that g is 1 over 8 pi m blank squared. All right, so again, we see that in this theory, we recover the correct Newtonian potential for a static point mass. All right, so this is an initial success. Uh, from Hij, we can also calculate the potential psi of r, which is going to be equal also to minus dm over r. And from these two potentials, we can calculate uh, the angle of deflection of light in a gravitational field, and namely, the angle alpha is going to be related to, uh, let's just do proportional to 2 times 1 plus gamma divided by the impact parameter b, where this gamma here is the ratio of the two potentials, psi of r divided by phi r, like so. So for this theory here, we simply have that gamma is equal to 1. So that alpha carries a factor uh, of 4 over b. Uh, and in fact, you need a gm over here as well. All right, so in this theory uh, of linear gravity, we do in fact recover the correct bending of light that we observe. So phenomenologically, this does in fact seem to be a viable theory of gravity. All right, so it succeeds where the spin 0 case fails. All right, but this isn't actually the end of the story. And the problem is the following. So the problem is that you can't consistently couple linearized gravity to a dynamical stress tensor. So here we took t mu nu uh, to be some point mass, right? Proportional to some m times some deltas. And we completely ignored the dynamics of t mu nu here. Uh, but if you have a dynamical t mu nu, then in fact that theory over there is inconsistent. And the reason for this is the following. So we have this linearized diff invariant. And the, in order for this term here, to be diffeomorphism invariant, it means that t mu nu has to be exactly conserved, like so. This is what this theory tells us. But remember that t mu nu refers to just the stress tensor 
of the matter sector of our theory. It doesn't contain any gravitational energy in it at all. And so what this expression is telling you is it's telling you that matter fields can't exchange energy with a gravitational field. All right, which we know is inconsistent. So it's inconsistent with the equations of motion. So if you calculate the equations of motion of your matter sector, you're going to find that they don't satisfy this condition. Um, and in addition, conceptually, it's inconsistent in the sense that it would tell you that, say, a point, a point particle in a gravitational field would not accelerate. All right, so we know that this can't be correct. So linearized GR coupled to a dynamical source is inconsistent. All right, so the way around this problem is that you want to modify uh, this stress tensor T mu nu so that it includes the gravitational energy as well as uh, the energy of your matter sector, because then these two sectors will be able to exchange energy with each other. All right, so how do we fix this? We want to take our T mu nu and we want to replace it with T mu nu plus some theta mu nu here where now this theta mu nu is going to correspond to the stress tensor associated with this part of my action. All right, so we know how to calculate that. Um, that's simply going to be, essentially, it's going to contain terms that are like variation uh, of dl2, d, d mu h alpha beta, uh, d nu h alpha beta, like so. Now. These terms are quadratic in the fields. They're quadratic in derivatives, and they're quadratic in the field H as well, which means that in order to have this term showing up in my Einstein's equation, so the equations of motion here are basically we have linearized Einstein tensor, g mu nu, uh, goes like t mu nu. And now we want to add this theta term on the right-hand side of the equation. So this term is quadratic on the field. In order to have that show up in my equations of motion, it means that I have to take my action S, S2, and I have to add to it terms that are cubic now in the fields in order to generate this term here. So this piece is quadratic in the fields. It came from S2. But now in order to generate the term in the equations of motion, it means that I have to add some S3 to my action as well. All right, but you can start to see what the problem is. So if I now have some terms here that are cubic in H, so I'm taking this action and I'm adding terms that go, uh, say, as some d squared H cubed, something like that, these are going to generate additional terms in my stress tensor as well. So it's going to generate terms that go of order H cubed, like so. And so once again, I'm going to have to add terms higher order in my action in order to generate these guys. And of course, this goes on. Uh, and it goes on infinitely. Uh, and what you find when you do this procedure uh, to all orders, uh, the action that you end up with is uniquely up to boundary terms, the action of general relativity. All right, so this procedure leads you to general relativity. Um, I should say, though, so, so this was successfully carried out um, by Deser. Uh, and this is in 1970. And in fact, the way that Desert did it uh, is using first order formalism uh, and also using the inverse metric uh, rather than the metric. Uh, he was able actually to carry out this procedure in a single step. So in fact, in first order form and using inverse metrics, there's only one term uh, that you have to add to the action. So it's a much simpler way of dividing this. But conceptually, it's the same principle here. That's what's going on. Yes. Ah, so you want to add this term because you don't want the stress tensor of matter by itself to be conserved. You want the stress tensor of matter plus the gravitational stress tensor to be conserved because that's telling you then uh, that your matter fields and your, your gravitational field can exchange energy with each other. Are there are other questions.
uh, by itself? Yeah, it's just a theory of a free massless spin two field. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so this procedure leads you uniquely to general relativity. Um, so this, this leads us to the, the claim, the moral of the story, uh, is that general relativity, in fact, is the only consistent Poincaré invariant low energy theory uh, of a massless spin two field. Uh, and I should say that this program was initiated uh, and carried out in many ways uh, by other people besides Deser. Uh, so in particular, uh, I can refer you to the papers of Feynman, Gupta, Weinberg, uh, and also a paper by Buller and Deser. Okay, so to go back to our original question uh, of trying to write down uh, an appropriate field theory that describes gravity, we ruled out spin zero and spin one on phenomenological grounds. We could rule out higher spin uh, based on theoretical consistency. For a massless spin two particle, we now have a unique consistent theory. So the only piece that's missing now is massive gravity. So what about a massive spin two field? Can this possibly describe uh, the gravitational field that we see in our universe? Yes. Uh, so, so you want to? No. So the, the problem with higher spin is that you want to couple to a conserved tensor. Um, so for I should say it's for mostly for it's the no go is for massless high spin particles. So for massless high spin particles, you need a gauge invariance, which means that when they couple. Uh, to your matter sector, they have to couple to some conserved current, and there are simply no high spin conserved currents that we can write down. Yeah. Okay. All right, so our starting point for the massive spin two uh, is going to be, again, the theory, the linearized theory of Fürth and Pauli here for the massless spin two. But now we're going to add to it a non-derivative interaction, so mass terms. So to this theory, we can add terms of the following form to describe a massive spin two. We can add terms that look like say an m1 squared, h mu nu, h mu nu. Or we can add terms that look like, say, some m2 squared, h squared, where h is the trace of h mu nu here. So these are the two terms that we can write down that are quadratic in the fields that contain no derivatives. Uh, and these are going to act as mass terms for our field. All right, but the thing about writing down these mass terms is we said that in order to get the right number of degrees of freedom, uh, for the massless graviton, we needed to have this linearized diffeomorphism invariance. So this d mu psi nu, d nu psi mu. By writing down these terms here, we're explicitly breaking this diffeomorphism invariance. And because of that, we're going to have extra propagating degrees of freedom in the theory.
Now, by itself, this isn't actually a problem because we know, in fact, that a massive graviton should propagate more helicities than the massless graviton. So a massive graviton contains not only the plus minus two helicities, but also the plus minus one and a zero helicity as well. So in fact, a massive graviton should have uh, 2s plus one or five degrees of freedom. All right, but how many degrees of freedom does this theory actually carry? So now the equations of motion are going to look like the following. So the equations of motion for this theory, I have the linearized Einstein tensor, g1 mu nu, uh, and now I'm also gonna have pieces coming from the mass terms as well. So I'm gonna have an m1 squared h mu nu plus an m2 squared eta mu nu times h, like so. Uh, and let's ignore the coupling to matter for a moment. All right, so these are my equations of motion. Now, if I take the divergence of this, I know because, this, uh, because the original massless theory does have this gauge invariance, that's telling me that d mu, g mu nu, by itself is identically zero, right? And as a consequence, uh, I have a constraint equation for the h mu nu. So m1 squared d mu h mu nu plus m2 squared d nu h should be equal to zero. So these are on-shell constraints on the components of h mu nu. So my index uh, runs over 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, so in fact, these are four equations. So they represent four constraints on the 10 components of h mu nu. So I have 10 components minus four constraints. And these are gonna give me six propagating degrees of freedom. Okay, but this is one too many, right? We wanted a theory that only described uh, the five helicities of the massive graviton. So we have an extra component now uh, that's floating around in our theory. So what can we do? So in the theory of Fierce and Pauli, uh, they pick particular values for this m1 squared and m2 squared here. So in particular, uh, they had that uh, m2 squared is equal to minus m1 squared, uh, which is equal to m squared. So this term here takes the following form. So you get minus 1 half h mu nu h mu nu minus h squared, like so. Okay, so why does this help the issue? Uh, well, let's go back to the equation of motion here. Uh, and let me take the trace of this expression. So taking the trace, I get that g1 mu mu is gonna be equal to, uh, so now here, this is gonna look like uh, minus m squared minus eta mu nu h, like so. Uh, so when I take the, tra the trace of this expression, uh, I'm gonna get a minus m squared. This is gonna give me an h, and this is gonna give me a d, a minus d as well. So in fact, I can write this as plus m squared d minus one h is equal to zero. Okay. But g mu mu, uh, I know what the trace of this is. Uh, so when we calculate, this is just simply equal to d mu d mu h mu nu, uh, sorry, minus box h, like so. On top of which, uh, we also have uh, our original constraint equation. So this is one set of equations. We also have the original constraint equation, which is now telling us that m squared d mu h mu nu minus d nu h is equal to zero. So if I take a derivative of this expression, this is m squared d mu d nu, h mu nu uh, minus box h is equal to zero. But this is precisely the linearized Einstein tensor, right? So that's telling me that this piece here on this constraint, I can set this equal to zero. So using this constraint, I see that in fact I have another constraint in my theory 
which is telling me that m squared h is equal to zero as well. All right, and that's precisely because of this particular tuning of the mass terms relative to each other. All right, so now I have a theory where I started out with the 10 components. I still have these four constraints, the four on-shell constraints that I had before. But now in addition, I have this trace-free constraint as well. So I have 10 minus 4 minus 1, or 5 degrees of freedom in this theory, which is what I want. So this is the, this is the Fierce Pauli theory uh, of linearized massive gravity. Uh, and it propagates the right number of degrees of freedom. All right, we're going to do the same thing we did before, uh, and we're going to ask about the, the phenomenology of this theory, uh, and basically the simple problem of what happens when I couple this to a point source. Yes? Uh, so this is the only relation in the masses that gives you an additional constraint. Okay, so again, let's consider this point source. So T mu nu equals M delta zero mu delta zero nu d cubed x, like so. Uh, and once again, we can calculate the components of H given this point source. So we find the following. We find H zero zero is equal to minus four thirds M over eight pi m Planck r, e to the minus mr, which gives us the Newtonian potential phi of r, which is equal to minus 4 thirds uh, g m over r, e to the minus mr. Uh, and we also have h i j is equal to 2 thirds now m over 8 pi m p r e to the minus mr, so that psi of r uh, is equal to minus 2 thirds gm over r, e to the minus mr. All right, so the Yukawa suppression is something that we expect, right? That's what we expect to happen when we add a, a mass to a theory, exactly what happened in the case of the spin zero particle here. So once again, we find uh, that at distances that are large compared to the inverse mass of the graviton, uh, we're going to see this suppression. The surprising thing is these factors of four-thirds and these factors of two-thirds compared to the case of the massless spin two particle. So these are extra numerical factors. And what they mean is that in the m goes to zero limit of this theory, I don't, in fact, recover the same solutions as I had for the massless spin two. So m goes to zero limit, doesn't recover. Now you could say, is this really such a problem, right? Because I have Newton's constant out here in front. And I could absorb this factor of 4 thirds into Newton's constant and not see anything different in the m goes to zero limit. Um, but once again, the answer lies in what happens if you calculate um, the, the deflection of light around a massive source. So remember we had that, that alpha goes like uh, two times one plus gamma over the impact parameter B, where gamma was the ratio of psi over phi. So now it's gonna give me a one half rather than a one, right? And that's independent of whether or not I've absorbed this factor of four thirds into G or not. So now this is gonna give me a two times one plus one half, or a two times three fourths versus two times two that we had. So these two theories differ from each other by a factor of three fourths. All right, two times three fourths, so this goes like three halves versus four for the case of the massless spin two field. So this is telling us um, that even for a very small mass, we would be wrong when we observe the bending of light uh, by a magnitude of order one, basically.
All right, so this is a manifestation of what goes by the name of the VDVZ discontinuity. So this is Van Dam, uh, Veltman, and Zakharov uh, in 1970 or 72. And the reason for it is actually not that hard to understand. So remember that um, in order to describe the massive graviton, we had to introduce extra degrees of freedom into the theory, right? So the point is that even when I take the, this massless limit, the massless limit doesn't get rid of the extra degrees of freedom. It just sends their mass equal to zero. And so I, even in the massless limit, I end up with a theory that has more degrees of freedom than the original theory of a massless spin two. And we'll see that, in fact, it's the helicity zero mode um, of, the massless, of the massive graviton that's sticking around uh, and giving rise to this discrepancy here. Um, but I should say that, that uh, so this, this discontinuity is important, um, both on phenomenological reasons, because it would seem to rule out massive gravity as a viable theory of gravity, um, but also theoretically it's a little bit unsettling, right? Because it means that uh, in nature you would be able to tell the difference uh, between a graviton whose mass was truly zero and a, mass who's, and a graviton whose mass was arbitrarily close to zero as well. All right, so how do we see where this is coming from? So there's a nice way uh, to look at the origin of this discontinuity. Um, and that's by using what's known as the Stuckelberg trick, or the Stuckelberg method. Which has the following idea. So remember that this, this mass term here broke the diff invariance, the linear diff invariance of the massless theory. So what we can do is we can introduce extra fields into our theory precisely as to restore uh, the diff invariance, the linearized diff invariance. But because we're introducing fields basically in one-to-one -one correspondence with the symmetries that we're introducing, we're not actually introducing any additional degrees of freedom into the theory. So this theory has the exact same physical content uh, as the theory of massive gravity with broken diff invariance. Uh, it's just a way to, to sort of keep track of the additional degrees of freedom of the massive graviton. So hopefully this will become more clear. Uh, but the idea is that we take our original h mu nu and we replace it with an h mu nu. And I'm going to canonically normalize. So I'm going to have a plus 1 over m d mu a nu plus d mu a nu. Sorry, d nu a mu plus 2 over m squared d mu d nu phi, like so. So this was an original field that represented our massive graviton. Now we'll see that this field is going to correspond to the helicity plus minus 2 modes. This field will give us the helicity plus minus 1. And this field will reflect the helicity 0 mode of the massive graviton. And the reason that what I can do this, um, so I have these new fields, a mu and phi. So it would seem like I'm introducing additional degrees of freedom into my theory. Um, but in fact, this new theory where I replace uh, h mu nu with this combination of fields uh, enjoys these two gauge transformations. So my theory is now invariant under the following transformation. So under now delta h mu nu. Uh, is equal to d mu psi nu plus d nu psi mu, while simultaneously now transforming the A field. So delta A mu is going to be transformed by minus m psi mu when I perform this transformation on H. Uh, and in fact, besides this sort of restoration of linearized diff invariance, I'm also going to introduce uh, a U1 symmetry. So by writing the fields in this way, I also have an invariance. Delta A mu is equal to D mu lambda uh, as long as I perform a simultaneous transformation of phi so that delta phi is equal to minus M lambda, like so. OK, so because I've introduced the same number of gauge invariances uh, as I have fields, 
Um, what this means in principle, in basically, is that I can pick a unitary gauge uh, in which I set these new fields equal to zero, uh, and I recover the original theory of massive gravity. So these are really pure gauge degrees of freedom uh, that I've introduced here. Um, so they're not changing the physical content of the theory in any way. All right, so what does our new theory look like uh, after doing this transformation? Uh, so this is going to help us isolate uh, the origin of this VDVZ discontinuity. So you can think of this as being like a holicity decomposition uh, of the spin two fields. So it's going to help us identify uh, in a particular limit uh, the holicity plus minus two, plus minus one, and holicity zero modes of the massive graviton. So we're, we're decompo essentially decomposing um, the field into its holicities. Uh, so in the absence of sources, the trace of H is zero on shell. That's right. Yeah, this, so this is, this is the on shell constraint. Yeah. Sorry, which H are you referring to? Yes, that's right. Uh, in the massive gravity theory on shell. Okay. So yeah, so I have the equation of motion g1 mu nu is equal to some t mu nu, and this contains h mu nu's in it. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not necessarily equal to zero. It depends what gauge you're in. Okay, in vacuum? Yeah. Okay. Then you have gravitational and propagation. Yes. And you have H mu nu, trace is zero. In a particular gauge, for example. Yes. yes. Now, if that particular gauge goes to the massive gravity. Yes. That's right. This is a now an on-shell constraint equation. This H and this is H and H. Uh, no, the, I mean, the field H mu nu is the same. It's just here, this corresponds to a, a massless graviton, and here it's a, a massive graviton. Yes. That's right. That's right, yeah. But this is so, so in, in massive gravity, we can't even talk about gauges, right? Uh, so it's, it's not a statement of, of whether you can go to a gauge in which H is equal to zero. This is just always true now on shell. So yeah. Yeah, in fact, you can't choose a gauge in, in this sense, but this is just always equal to zero now. Yeah, that's right. Other questions? Okay, very good. Uh, so we're doing this, this field redefinition here, uh, and we get the following form for our Lagrangian. Uh, so I'm just plugging this in uh, to that action down there, and we find that L is gonna be equal to uh, the M equals zero L, and in fact, all the new terms that we're going to get are only gonna be coming uh, from the mass term here as well, and that's because the kinetic term was already invariant under this linearized diff. And you can think of these extra fields here um, as being completely absorbable by a, a diff transformation. So we shouldn't get any new terms that depend on the fields coming from the kinetic part of the theory. It's only from the mass terms uh, that we're gonna get fields, uh, the amu and the phi that show up in our new Lagrangian. 
So the, lun the new Lagrangian m equals zero, uh, sorry, the new Lagrangian is going to be L of m equals zero, uh, plus these extra pieces. So now we're going to have minus one half m squared h mu nu h mu nu, where now this is our new h mu nu uh, minus h squared. Uh, we're going to have a kinetic term uh, for the spin one field for the a mu. So there's going to be an f mu nu, f mu nu minus 2m h mu nu d mu a nu. So this term mixes uh, the holicity two components with the holicity one component, or I should say the h with the a's, d mu a mu uh, minus twice. Now we have a term that mixes h mu nu uh, with the phi, so d mu phi d nu phi uh, minus h squared d squared phi. Uh, and again, if we assume that, our, that we're coupling to a stress tensor that's conserved, uh, we're going to get no contribution from these new fields coupled to the stress tensor because we can just undo those with a gauge transformation. Uh, so we're just going to get the usual 1 over mp h mu nu t mu nu, like so. Okay, so this is our theory after, after performing this field redefinition. All right, so now we, what we're, our motivation is to sort of understand the origin of this VDBZ discontinuity. So let's see what happens now if we take this theory uh, where we've introduced these, these pure gauge fields and let's take the m goes to zero limit of this theory. And what we find is the following. So, this term is going to drop out completely, uh, as well as the mass term as well. And so what we're left with is L uh, is equal to the original Lagrangian at zero mass. We have the kinetic term for A mu. Uh, but now A mu is decoupled from every other field, right? So this stands by itself. Uh, and in addition, we have minus twice the term that mixes H mu nu uh, and D mu d nu phi minus h d squared phi, like so, and plus the mass term, or sorry, plus the, the interaction term, like here. Okay, so now we can really see in this massless limit that this is a theory that propagates five degrees of freedom, right? So we have a Lagrangian for a massless spin two field, um, which is gonna propagate two degrees of freedom in addition, we're adding to it a Lagrangian of a massless now spin one field. Uh, so this is going to propagate an additional two degrees of freedom corresponding to helicity plus minus one. Uh, and this field is decoupled from all the other fields. So it doesn't interact with the helicity two, uh, the helicity zero, or with the stress tensor as well. Uh, but in addition, we have this scalar mode, an extra one degree of freedom. So these are really the five degrees of freedom of our original massive graviton. Uh, now in this massless limit. Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you're saying, sorry, go ahead. So, so what's happening here uh, is, in fact, these aren't these other degrees of freedom are not high energy degrees of freedom. So what, what you're thinking of is, is, say, the Goldstone boson decoupling from the radial mode, right, which is a heavy degree of freedom in the theory. Here, these are really massless degrees of freedom that, that survive in this limit. Yes. 
the, the new AMU, or, so th those, are, those aren't um, the photon, so there's, they're a new massless spin one particle. Spin one, yeah. That's right. It's not the photon, that's right. Yes? Sorry? Ah, no, so, the, so again, I'm just putting in uh, some conserved stress tensor by hand that's meant to represent some coupling to a, a conserved source in this theory. That's right. Uh, so it, it acts as a spin one, but it doesn't couple to this T mu nu. So it's not acting like an additional force, an additional gravitational force. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Other questions? Okay, so the, the final step, what we want to do here, um, is we want to put this in a, in a standard form uh, by demixing the holicity two with the holicity one here. So we have this, this uh, linear mixing between the two. Uh, and let's, let's demix them. So in order to do that, uh, we can perform the following transformation. So we can now write h mu nu as h mu nu plus phi times some eta mu nu. So this is just a field redefinition. I'm not doing anything funny here. Uh, and plug it into this expression. Uh, and what you find is the following. So under this replacement, L goes to L of m equals zero now with this new h mu nu. Uh, once again, the spin one part is untouched. So f mu nu, f mu nu. Uh, the mixing term becomes a pure kinetic term for the spin zero part. Uh, so I haven't canonically normalized, so this is minus three d mu phi squared. Uh, but now, because I've done this transformation, uh, I'm going to pick up an interaction between the helicity zero mode and the trace of the stress tensor here. So now, in addition to having a 1 over mp h mu nu t mu nu, I'm also going to have a 1 over mp phi t, right? So now I can really see what's going on in this theory. I have a free massless spin two, a free massless spin one, a free massless spin zero, but the spin zero couples to the trace of the stress tensor of this theory in this massless limit. So it's this coupling here that we can see is the origin of this VDBZ discontinuity. So even in the massless limit, you have an additional field that's interacting uh, with your sources and giving rise to an additional force. Yeah. Uh, in the presence of matter. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it's going to be a constraint equation, but it's going to depend on, on trace of t mu nu. Yeah, well, yeah that's right. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the vacuum, it's, it's the same theory. OK, OK. Very good. Um, so that's, that's exactly where we're heading. Um, so the, it turns out that a possible resolution to this VDVZ discontinuity um, could be that, that higher order terms become important um, and can, can screen this, this fifth force at short distances. But that's, that's exactly where we're heading. Yeah. Other questions? OK. So. The origin of this VDVZ discontinuity, um, sorry, the, the presence of this VDVZ discontinuity would seem to rule out uh, massive gravity as a, as a viable gravitational theory. Um, however, as was just brought up, this is just a linearized theory. 
uh, of massive gravity. So as we saw before for the case of massless gravity, nonlinearities were in fact needed in order to restore the theoretical consistency of the theory. Now here, it's not a matter of theoretical consistency so much as phenomenological viability, but at the same time, it's worthwhile asking what happens if we introduce nonlinearities into this theory? Can, this, can that help us out at all um, with this VDVZ discontinuity? Um, so that motivates the search uh, for nonlinear massive gravity. All right, so our starting point uh, in a theory of nonlinear massive gravity uh, is going to be the following. So instead of writing down uh, the linearized theory of a spin 2 uh, plus this Fiertz Pauli mass term, we're going to start by writing down the Einstein Hilbert term, uh, which is fully nonlinear, and then adding to it the linearized Fiertz Pauli mass term, and just exploring and seeing what exactly this theory gives us. Okay. So our action now is going to be integral d4x, usual Einstein-Hilbert term. And now we're going to add to it, uh, written in terms still of the metric perturbation, h mu nu, uh, minus 1 fourth m squared, eta mu alpha, uh, eta nu beta, h mu nu, h alpha beta minus h mu alpha, h nu beta. So here I'm being very explicit um, that the indices of the fluctuation h are always going to be raised and lowered with the Minkowski reference metric in this theory, um, whereas uh, this term here, of course, is expressed fully nonlinearly in terms of g mu. Uh, if we want, of course, we can always expand this term uh, in terms of eta mu nu, uh, and h mu nu over m Planck, in which, term, in which case this is just going to give us a series of terms that contain two derivatives and ever-increasing powers of h, right? So this is just going to give us some d squared h squared plus d squared h cubed and so forth. So I'm sort of mixing notations here with the g and the h. Um, it's also worthwhile pointing out that the reason that we're, we're writing it in this way, um, if you want to write down a, a nonlinear mass term, for the graviton, you're always going to have to introduce an additional reference metric into your theory. In other words, there's no way of introducing in the nonlinear theory a non-derivative interaction that only uses g mu nu and no other tensor. And the reason for this is the only things that you can construct out of g mu nu by itself are just trace of g, which is equal to a number, or determinant of g which is just a cosmological constant. So in order to write down a, a non-derivative interaction for g mu nu, we're in fact forced to have this additional metric structure here. OK, and just to say, so this is the usual, of course, Einstein-Hilbert term, that now instead of the linearized diff invariance, uh, enjoys the full diff invariance, delta g mu nu is equal to now d mu psi nu symmetrized like so. OK, so let's take this theory. And now we're going to do, once again, the exact same thing we did before. We're going to introduce a static point source and see what we get. So in fact, before doing uh, uh, this exercise for the massive case, uh, let's just uh, remind ourselves what happens if we run the same argument now for the nonlinear theory uh, of massless gravity. So if I just look at the Einstein-Hilbert term uh, and I introduce a static point source, uh, and once again, I go to the Lorenz gauge. So the solution that I find uh, can be expanded in the following way. Uh, so this is for for massless gr. So we find that h0,0 0, 0 is equal to minus 2 gm over r. But now, 
uh, written in terms of an expansion, 1 minus GM over R, plus terms that are higher order in GM over R. And similarly, HIJ is equal to plus GM over R, 1 plus 3 GM over 4R, plus additional terms, delta IJ, like so. Okay, and of course we know that, that uh, in general relativity we can complete the sum of these terms and we just get the usual Schwarzschild solution. The reason why I'm writing it in this way uh, is we see that at lowest order, uh, we recover, of course, the Newtonian potentials, um, but we can also see the scale at which nonlinearities become important in this theory, right? So this is telling us that in the presence of some source of mass m, the nonlinearities are going to be important when my distance to the source uh, is of order the Schwarzschild radius, right? So non. R is of RG, which is, of course, 2GM. And for scales, we know that this is roughly, of course, 3 kilometers when M is of order a solar mass, like so. Okay, this is the usual story uh, for nonlinear massless GR. Now, if we do the massive case instead, so now we're going to include these terms, and again solve for little h, what we find is the following. So we have H00 is equal to, we find the same 4 thirds factor, of course, that we did before. So minus 4 thirds, uh, 2 GM over R. And now we have 1 minus 1 sixth GM divided by little m to the fourth, R to the fifth, plus higher order terms. Uh, whereas for HRR, we now have minus 4 thirds, 2 GM over R. 1 over m squared, r squared, uh, 1 minus, I have a 14 here, gm over m to the fourth, r to the fifth, plus higher order terms. Okay, so what's happened here is that this scale has changed. So the scale at which nonlinearities become important now when you have a theory of massive gravity, uh, it's much lower than in the case for the massless spin 2. And in particular, we can read off that nonlinearities become important when now we have R is of order what's known as the Weinstein radius, which in this case is going to be equal to GM divided by little m to the fourth, all to the one-fifth power, like so. Okay, so a few things to notice here. So we're, we're always interested uh, in a very, not always, we're generally interested in a very light massive graviton. Uh, we usually take that mass to be of order the Hubble scale because we're interested in cosmological effects. So if we just take these expressions here, uh, and now again we plug in a solar mass for our source and the Hubble scale for the graviton mass, what you find for this Weinstein radius is 10 to the 19 kilometers. So huge compared to what we expect for nonlinearities in GR. So this is well outside the solar system, of course, um, which means that if we really want to talk about, say, the VDVZ discontinuity um, and whether or not this is an obstruction for the phenomenological viability of the theory, then we need to know the effect of these nonlinearities inside our solar system first. All right, so this, this mechanism was first uh, described by Weinstein. Uh, it goes by the name of the Weinstein mechanism. Uh, and the idea is the following. So first notice uh, that because uh, the Weinstein radius scales with inverse powers of the graviton mass, 
that when you take the little m goes to zero limit, so when you take the massless limit of this theory, the Weinstein radius goes to infinity, right? So as little m goes to zero, rv goes to infinity. So what this means is that if you have a nonlinear theory of massive gravity and you take the massless limit, in fact, there becomes no regime in which you can trust the linearized theory. So all the statements that we were making before become invalid in the m goes to zero limit of a nonlinear theory of gravity. So then it becomes the case um, that if the nonlinear interactions are such um, that this extra force gets screened within the Weinstein radius, then the predictions of massive gravity, in fact, can be reconciled with what we actually observe in the solar system. So the idea would be that, suppose we have some source M and a radius outside that source up to RV, this Weinstein radius, and in this regime, nonlinearities are going to be important. But it's possible that we could introduce nonlinearities in such a way that the predictions of GR are restored at short distances. Whereas outside the Weinstein radius, uh, you would be able to use the linearized theory of massive gravity. And there, the predictions would deviate from GR, uh, but they might not be obstructions to the phenomenological viability of the theory. All right, so this goes by the name of the Weinstein mechanism. Are there questions about this? Yeah? That's right. Yeah, yeah, you would need to know the, the full nonlinear theory and solve. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what part of it? Yeah, no, no, so that's the idea, is that it's, it's, a, it's just saying that if you had such a theory, then you would be able to, to evade these. So then the questions that people want to solve is, can you write down a theory that does this? So this is the goal. Yeah. Okay, so this is the aim. So the question now becomes, can you write down a nonlinear theory of massive gravity that does in fact have this property, so that general relativity is restored at short distance? But before we even get there, again, there's potentially a problem. So remember for the linear theory of massive gravity, we had to pick the mass term such that we generated this additional constraint on the equations of motion, and it was this constraint that got rid of the extra degree of freedom. So this was necessary to having a healthy theory that propagated the right number of degrees of freedom. Now we're talking about adding nonlinear interactions to this theory, and we should ask what happens to the constraint in this case. So if I just take these two terms and add them together, um, do I still have an additional constraint in this theory? All right, so this was a, a problem that was investigated uh, by Boulevard and Deser uh, in 1972. Uh, and so there's a nice way to, to study degrees of freedom uh, in these nonlinear theories, in particular to count degrees of freedom uh, in the nonlinear theories. Uh, so in order to do that, I'm going to adopt this ADM framework uh, for, for gravity. Uh, so this is Boulevard and Deser. 
And in the ADM framework, uh, I'm going to perform the following decomposition. So I'm going to introduce a function known as the lapse, n, which is related to the g00 component of the metric. Uh, I'm going to introduce three functions known as the shift, n i, which are related to the g0 i components of the metric. Uh, and finally, I'm just going to call the spatial components of the metric g i j. Uh, I'm going to label them as gamma i j. So this is just a decomposition of the usual metric. So the lapse contains one component. The shift contains three components. The gamma is a symmetric three by three matrix. So it contains six components. So this is just another way of rewriting all 10 components uh, of the metric as well. All right, but let's take a look at what happens uh, when I just look at general relativity uh, within the context of this decomposition here. So first, we're going to count degrees of freedom in GR. So if I take usual massless general relativity uh, and I perform this decomposition, what I find is the following. So my action S, I can write uh, in terms of canonical variables uh, as mp squared over 2 integral d4 x. Pi ij gamma dot ij minus n times some function c, which depends on gamma and pi minus n i c i times some function that depends on gamma and pi. So now here, the pi i j are the momenta canonically conjugate to the gammas. The laps in the shift appear linearly without time derivatives. And these functions c and ci depend only on the gammas and their canonically conjugate momentum, pi. All right, so in other words, uh, if I were to write down the Hamiltonian of this system, I would see that it's just equal to nc plus ni pi, like so. Now, this form is useful uh, in the following regard. So the key point uh, is first that the lapse and shift appear without time derivatives, so they appear non-dynamically. They have no canonically conjugate momenta. They don't represent propagating degrees of freedom. So n and i are non-dynamical. Whereas the gamma and the pi represent 6 times 2 potentially propagating degrees of freedom. OK, but the lapse and shift n on i, on top of being non-dynamical, uh, they also appear linearly in the Lagrangian, right? And what that means is that they act as Lagrange multipliers. So their equations of motion are going to enforce constraints on the remaining dynamical degrees of freedom. So if I vary this action with respect to n and n i, I'm going to find the constraint equations. C, which depends only on gamma and pi, is equal to 0, and C i, which depends only on gamma and pi, is equal to 0, like so. So the lapse and the shift uh, in general relativity enforce four constraints on the dynamical fields. So if I count phase space degrees of freedom, uh, I start out with 6 times 2. I have 12 degrees of freedom. I have four constraints. enforced by the lapse and shift. And in addition, uh, these constraints generate the diffeomorphism invariance of the theory. So I can use the diff invariance of the theory to remove an additional four degrees of freedom. So now, when I add this up, I see that I'm left with four, which is equal to two times two, 
phase space degrees of freedom for this theory. So this is the right number of degrees of freedom uh, for a propagating massless spin two particle. All right, so this is the usual story in general relativity. So now we can see what happens uh, if we take the same action here, sorry, the same decomposition here, uh, and we plug it into our theory of massive GR. Uh, so where we just had the Einstein-Hilbert term plus this fierce pauli mass term. So now after doing this decomposition, uh, the action is going to have the following form. So S is equal to mp squared over 2, d4x. We get the same thing from the kinetic piece, gamma ij dot. But now from the mass term, we get the following additional pieces. So there's going to be a minus uh, m squared over 4, delta ik, delta jl, All right, like so. OK, so now we observe the following thing. So from the mass term, we're getting additional pieces uh, that depend on the lapse and the shift, right? So we have this n squared piece, and we have this ni and j piece. So the n, the lapse, and the shift still appear non-dynamically. But now they also appear nonlinearly, which means that their equations of motion are no longer going to be constraints on the additional variables. If I vary with respect to lapse and shift, I'm going to find equations which depend on lapse and shift, and I can use those equations to solve for the values of lapse and shift uh, as a function of the other variables. But they're no longer going to be constraints. And in addition, uh, by adding this mass term, we've now explicitly broken the nonlinear diffeomorphism invariance of the massive gravity theory. So diff invariance is broken. So now when we go to count degrees of freedom in this theory, we find that we still have the 6 times 2 uh, potentially propagating degrees of freedom uh, from the, the pi and the gamma. But now we have no constraints, and we have no diff invariance. So in fact, at the end of the day, we're just left with 12 propagating phase space degrees of freedom, uh, or six normal propagating modes. So five of these uh, are going to be the helicity components uh, of the massive graviton. But now we have this extra mode that we had tried to get rid of uh, in the linear theory. And we see it's back again. Uh, for the fully nonlinear theory. All right, in addition to this, so in addition to just having this extra degree of freedom, uh, what Boulevard and Desert argued uh, is that the Hamiltonian of this theory is in fact unbounded from below. Uh, so not only uh, is this an extra mode, but it's a, it's a pathological mode, um, and it always comes with a wrong sign kinetic term. And thus, it represents truly an instability in the theory, an inconsistency in the theory. All right, so it's possible. So we're starting, this is analysis 
um, of the very specific theory, right, where we started with general relativity, uh, we added this Fürth Pauli mass term to it, which was quadratic in the fields. You could ask, okay, so this is the analysis uh, for this theory. What if I add higher order terms in H to the theory? Is it possible um, that I can kill this, this ghost mode um, through these nonlinear additions? So what about, now we start with Einstein Hilbert. Uh, we add these terms that were quadratic in the fields. So h mu nu squared h squared. And now what if we start adding terms, non-derivative terms, they go of order h cubed. So what Boulware and Desert argued in these papers um, is that these terms generically uh, are going to suffer from the same problem uh, as just the massive GR theory that we were studying before. So they argue that these nonlinear terms um, can't remove this extra degree of freedom. Uh, but it turns out that there are loopholes in these initial arguments. Um, and these loopholes have been successfully exploited uh, in the last few years. Uh, to write down consistent ghost-free theories of massive gravity. So I should have said uh, this extra degree of freedom because of this paper by Boulevard and Desert uh, goes by the name of the Boulevard Desert Ghost. Okay. But at this point in our story, uh, in 1972, uh, I could say we were left with the questions of uh, is there a nonlinear theory? Of massive gravity that exhibits the Weinstein mechanism. And is it free of the Boulevard Desert Ghost? All right. So these are the questions that I'll answer next time.